Welcome to the Open Door, Jim Hammond here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today we'll discuss retirement and redirection and making one's heart sing. Our welcome and returning guest is Mrs. Leslie Shaw Klinger, OP. That's Order of Preachers. Leslie is a life professed member of the Blessed Fra Angelico chapter of Old Dominicans. She's retired from one career as a government civil servant, where she held a variety of administrative positions and is about to retire as the assistant to Faith Formation Director of a large Catholic parish in the Central Valley of California. A runner of Scotty's, the San Francisco Giants, Golden State Warriors, and a 49er fanatic. That wasn't authorized, that term. A 49er fanatic since 1955. She has a unique perspective on retirement and faith. Let's begin as we always do in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Leslie, if we may, you have now retired twice. What's the difference this time? Will it stick? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this this morning. Um, just to clarify, my uh, retirement date from my present position is actually June 30th. And so I'm still in my last month and a half of work with my present position. In fact, I'm in the middle of sacramental season, which technically doesn't exist, but anybody who works for a Catholic parish will tell you is absolutely true. We, we start in like, April and go through June, and we have everything from First Holy Communions to confirmations to um, full initiations to coming into full communion, boom, and, and it sort of culminates on, on Pentecost Sunday in our parish with a giant potluck. So this is actually the busiest time of year for me, and it's also the time where I am putting together the information to give to whoever comes behind me um, for this position. My first um, retirement was actually um, spurred by changes to that particular position. I had worked for 29 plus years with Contra Costa County beginning um, as a beginning level clerk in 1987 and working my way up to lower management, lower middle management, if that makes any sense. Um, in the civil service world, uh, that means that you not only have to have a certain amount of time that you are in a position, but you have to pass tests and then you have to go through interview processes and then you have to wait for positions to open. And so for me, especially in administration, that meant that I worked in three different departments with Contra Costa County over my career. I started in, a, in social services. Um, I went from social services to health services. I went from health services to the DA department, um, to the district attorney. I went back to health services. And then from health services, I went into law enforcement. And that was my first um, um, giant promotion, so to speak, into um, management position. I was with law enforcement for about 10 years and a position opened up that was closer to home, that was a lateral move, and I should have suspected something 
um, when it turned out that I was the only person that applied for it. But it was only about, uh, it, was, it was a difference of about 45 minutes in my commute time. And so I went ahead and applied and I accepted the position and it was actually back to social services, but it was within a specific unit. And within um, two weeks of my being hired, I was told that my job would be to implement the Medi-Cal aspect of the Affordable Care Act for Contra Costa County. And so it was, um, it was quite an interesting time. It was the closest I've ever come to becoming a whistleblower um, to the point where I actually consulted an attorney and looked up the laws and then eventually started talking to um, a young lady out of USC who was doing um, a series of articles on how poorly the Affordable Care Act had been implemented in both a federal level and a um, state level. We moved the unit that I was in further away from home and because they really liked my <coughs> work, they kept me there um, and allowed me to, to adjust my hours and so that I was going early in the morning and leaving in the afternoon before the horrible commute traffic started. Um, and then in December of 2016, they said that they could no longer do that, that I would have to go to an eight to five job. And I was really, um, I was not happy about that. And I, I really gave that unhappiness to the God of my understanding and said, I, I need help. I don't know what to do, should I have. I'm so close to retirement, but I'm not in a position yet where I could live completely on that pension. So I need your help. And I was literally sitting in um, mass um, before Mass, I was reading the bulletin because as everybody know, Catholics read the bulletin, we don't read the Bible. And so as I was reading the bulletin, I noticed that the parish had a position for the coordinator of the parish school of religion. And I told my mother, I was sitting next to me, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to apply for this. And let's just see what happens. And it turned out that they were willing to wait for me to retire in 2017 so that I could get a full 30 years. So I retired um, on May 29th, 2017, and on April the 3rd, I started my new job with um, St. Joseph's Parish. And I have been with St. Joseph's now for five years. And um, at this time, because I got that extra five years of work, my um, social security will be about $25 more a month than what I'm earning right now at St. Joseph's. So I went ahead and put in for my retirement and that is how I ended up retiring twice. So the difference this time is that number one, I am more, I am financially secure. I will be able to live on my pension and social security and I have no intention of leaving the parish. I will still be a presence there in terms of my volunteer work. And so they will still have me there as a steward, in particular in catechesis for um, children and adults through the RCIA process. Leslie, that uh, gives us a, a good picture uh, and certainly a picture of financial considerations. <clears throat> And you'd think I'd ask a serious question to get started about this, but, but I can't. I have to ask a different sort of question. Go, going back to your law enforcement days, level with us, please. Did you ever hear anyone say, cuff them? <laughs> no, but I, I will tell you, my, my position with law enforcement was I was the um, the graveyard shift supervisor for the records, warrants, and central identification unit for Contra Costa County. Now that sounds very sort of dry and unimportant. There were three big cases that broke during that particular time. And for a case to break, it begins with 
warrants being pulled to be served after an investigation. So that meant that my job, because it was I was the graveyard shift supervisor, that would be when those warrants would be pulled. And because I was the records, the records supervisor, any records that had to be pulled to back up that investigation would also happen at during the graveyard shift because not as many people, no interruptions from the outside. Most importantly, it could get, be, get done before the media um, heard about it. And then those warrants could be served and then a media announcement could be made. In both of, in all three of those cases, there was only one time that the media got wind of it beforehand. And because of the position that I was in, it would be these weird phone calls in the middle of the night from everybody from Oprah Winfrey to, to Dr. Phil to Dateline producers, um, you know, 48 hours, all of this stuff, um, trying to get information and, and will you go on the record and will you do this and that. And it was an amazingly weird and wonderful time. But the most important aspect of that job was that um, I determined to put into position um, a safe space for my officers. Um, we were in a lockdown facility, we were very safe, but it, I wanted, the word got out to all of our, our deputies that if they needed some place to go and just decompress, that there would always be a pot of coffee ready and that they could come in and talk to the supervisor in the middle of the night in her office and say anything they wanted. And I felt that that was the greatest gift that I was able to give to those deputies and it was the greatest gift that was given to me. And as the result of that, there are three, office, three deputies right now in Contra Costa County that returned to Holy Mother Church because they had a safe place to come in the middle of the night and talk. And when I left that position, I got phone calls from their wives thanking me. They said, because uh, of my, my husband's coming back to mass. That's beautiful. Now, getting more serious, and because he's approaching the age of retirement, I think that Mario will probably want to ask a question of a philosophical sort about the very concept of retirement. He, he's, he's action oriented. So even though he's of an age, well, he has questions. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I have a question. I just heard that uh, the biblical tradition claim that there is no such a thing as age retirement. So you are, uh, you retire once, you are gonna retire twice. Mm -hmm. So what do you have, or do you have any plan what to do after that? Or do you just stick around and do nothing? Oh, heavens no. No, um, you know, Mario, one of the, one of the things that as a Catholic, first of all, as a Catholic and as a Dominican, um, one of the things that well, I- Excuse me, what is the difference? Well, Dominicans have a very different type of spirituality than just basic Catholic. You know, the Catholic, uh, you can be a good Catholic and follow the five precepts of the church and be considered a very good and faithful Catholic. As a Dominican, there's a little bit more that's required. And one of the things that, that I know is that um, there are those, those we have a three-legged stool in the Catholic Church. So we not only have the biblical tradition, but we also have sacred tradition and we have the magisterial teachings. Um, the fact that the Bible doesn't say everybody needs to retire at the age of 65, that's an interesting thing, but that would be outside the purview of Holy Scripture. So I don't even worry about that. For me, retirement, and in, in, in particularly in our, um, in our society today, I look at it in, in two ways. That number one, I have been receiving a paycheck from somebody and a W-2 form 
since the age of 14. I have earned the right to be able to redirect my attention and abilities to something that I not only can be a good steward of, but that I can also enjoy. During that time, I was required to prepare for my future. That meant that I had to learn how to be a good steward of my present. So for instance, my decision to retire from Contra Costa County was made possible because God opened a door that allowed me to work at the parish. If that hadn't been there, I would have been doing a, a horrific commute for at least two more years. Just would have been the way it is. I would have sucked it up and I would have done it. Uh, but God opened this door for me. And as a result of that, for the last five years, I've been able to give to, not only earn a paycheck, but give to my faith community in a way that um, I wasn't able to do before. I'm now moving into a period of my life where I will still be able to give to my faith community, but now I can look at some of the things that I have always been interested in pursuing and I can do those things. Um, I am a lover of Scottish Terriers. I have loved Scotties since I first saw the movie Lady and the Tramp when I was about four years old. Um, I have owned at least one Scottish Terrier at a time for the last, since I was 27 years old. I've always wanted to breed Scottish Terriers. So I have put in motion all the things that I need to do to learn how to be a breeder of Scottish Terriers. And that's gonna be one of the things that I do after I retire. Um, I am an RCIA catechist. I've been certified as an RCIA catechist for over 20 years. Uh, because I've gotten to work with families and children in the last five years, uh, what I've noticed is an increase in the number of people that come to us and they say, hi, we've had this reconversion to the faith. We've been listening to Catholic radio. Here we are with our five children. They're all over the age of seven. None of them have been baptized. We're here to come back to the church, help us. And so we've had, I've had to develop, I actually had to put together a program for children that have to go through the RCIA process for two years before they can come and be fully initiated. I don't want to lose that program. And so I am making myself available as a specific catechist for those children and families that are coming into the church in their first year. I have people in place to take the second year. I will also be working with adults. Um, I am, I'm very active in a program that mentors people that are struggling with um, sobriety. And so I have a variety of speaking engagements that have already been set up starting in January. <coughs> Apparently the word got out, she's retiring. And so they have booked me into next year. I, um, I think that the term redirect is more important than retiring. But more importantly, what I'm doing is the culmination of a way of life that I was taught from the moment that I started working. And I am blessed <coughs> to have had the kind of um, family background that said to me when I got that first job at the ice arena at 14 years old, that said, <laughs> you're getting a paycheck now. Now you need to look for your future because 50 years from now, how you start taking care of your money today is going to matter. And I was actually taught that from the beginning. So because of that, I have, you know, I will never be an, a, an amazingly wealthy woman, but I have a roof over my head. I will be able to have food on the table. I will be able to pay the small bills that I have, and I'm gonna be able to do the things that I like to do without too much strain on my finances. More importantly, I'm going to be able to give generously to the people that I love and to, to the faith tradition that I love. Christopher Zender, where, where would you like to intervene? Well, a few things. I mean, uh, when we talk about retirement now, it almost seems like we're coming into a period of history where it's a class thing. How many people, I mean, um, a lot of people in their jobs can't save. Social security is never going to be sufficient for them. Uh, 
they have a they have a choice between paying for food and paying for rent. And even if you're not that desperate, um, some people just I mean it's the inflation, the you know the um, wage more or less wage stagnation because even when now they go up fifty dollars an hour, they don't give people the hours that they need to actually fulfill to actually work. I mean, to what degree are we are we talking about something which is proper to a particular group or class now when we talk about retirement? You know, I think that that's a really good question. Um, you know, I come from an immigrant background. My On my mother's side of the family, we're only second generation Americans. English was a second language in our family. And um, the information that was given to me from the very beginning was that you don't rely upon the government. You work your butt off. Um, my mother used to tell stories about how when um, FDR uh, pushed, pushed through and they established Social Security and my Aunt Jean was so happy about it, my Nono was like, oh, this is not going to be the answer from the very beginning. So we have always been given a way of life in my family that has said, you know, be prepared to to take care of yourself. Now, yes, I'm going to be collecting Social Security, which is money that I put in, but I've also, over the years, denied myself things so that I would have something for the future. That is not something that is taught to people today. The other thing that I think that you bring up is that there is always going to be a class of people that are never going to be able to earn the money to, uh, and go forward in the way that my family went forward. And, I, and what brings to mind is the idea that the, of what Jesus told us was that the poor will always be with us. And that becomes my responsibility. As a Catholic, as a person of, of, that loves her country, that loves her community, that loves her, her, that becomes my responsibility. And so I have to look at how I can, in my small way, help those people that haven't been in a position of saving money, are in a position where Social Security is not going to be enough for them, are in a position where they maybe all they have is disability or whatever, because that, that's the only thing that's available to them. So my work in my community looks at whatever way the community can support that. And, you know, 200, 300 years ago, that was something, a purview of the church. They, you know, the church tried to take care of its own. I think it's the purview of this society to do that, that we have to look and see what's out there. In Modesto, for instance, one of the things that we um, established a couple of years ago is um, a program for seniors called shared housing for, let's say, somebody like me who has a little home with one extra bedroom. If there's a senior out there that cannot afford an apartment, that because they're on disability, they only get $800 a month, but they would get a stipend from you know the community, they get help with a little bit of, of um, rent, I could offer them that bedroom and say, you could rent this room from, from me. And so we're pushing for programs like that out there that allows the community to step up and try to take care of people. We're also be, to having a hard look at how we have treated people in this country that, um, you know, the, the only thing that is available to them is, is minimum wage jobs. You know, a minimum wage job should be that job that a teenager gets, like I got at the age of 14, to teach them the value of work. It should not be the job where somebody is trying to support a family. So what do we have to do as a society to say to those people who only can, only can get a minimum wage job, how do we make you, your life better so that you can afford a safe place to live and a place to raise a family? And there's a variety of ways that we can look at that. We can look at that through education. We can look at whether or not our, our level of, of um, pay is what it should be. What is our housing situation in an area? There's all ways that that can be addressed. But my being able to retire, I should not be punished because I have the ability to retire. 
However, what I should be is challenged to make sure that those who don't are taken care of. That's my responsibility as a Catholic, to take care of those who can't. What about, what do you think the role of the government is? Uh, as you know, the popes and their socialists, popes and their socialists, I'm sorry, are, are, are calling for structural changes as well as just charity. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's important to have the charity, but it's also important to have the structural changes because when you live in a period where the middle class itself is shrinking, uh, something has to be done on a larger level than even even on a local community, local community. Yeah, it, and, and it's not, I don't think it's an easy question to, to answer. I don't think there, um, I think, first of all, I really do believe in, in capitalism in, in a kind of a broad sense. And I believe in using distributism as a, a way of, as an economic base. I also understand that the human condition is such that there are always going to be those people that work a little harder, that do a little more, that are just more, maybe either hardwired that way, or, well, I, I'm gonna say hardwired. They're just, that's just the way they're going to be. And I think that, that acknowledging that acknowledges the fact that we have different types of people. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're, one is better than the other, they're just different. I look at my own family, okay, and in particular, my brother has three children that I helped raise because of his particular lifestyle choices. My oldest is a young man who went into the military, served his country as a combat vet, came out, got a job with Amazon as a uh, um, temporary, worked his way, is already working his way up in the Amazon structure where he's now in to lower management at the age of 33. He's um, putting money away. He's doing all of these things. He's one of those kids that he will show up on time. He will give them his full attention for the entire time that he was there. And then, he, and he's already thinking for the, for the future. He took the lessons that I was taught by my mother that I handed on to him and he put them into place. The other two struggle. The other two are struggling. And uh, the, the middle one is kind of finally sort of getting his act together, so to speak, where he, because he was presented with some challenges, he now has um, a young lady in his life and two children. And he had to, you know, come up with a way to start supporting those kids. The youngest one, she is she's struggling and so there to me is a microcosm of our society all three were raised in the same way all three were given the same same um information one took to it like a fish in water the other it's taken him a while to get his feet under him and the youngest one you know bless her heart my hope is that she's 21 years old and at some point she will go oops I need to get my act together a little bit. So what do I do? Do I throw money at her? Do I make it easier for her? Or do I tell her, you can do this. I believe in you. You have the information. Make your choices. Look at your, the way you're living your life and make a decision and try to do the best you can. And no matter what, I love you. Okay, now she doesn't need to know that I've already made the personal decision that she's never going to be on the street. I will make, because there's nothing romantic about living on the street. And so I will make sure that she doesn't live on the street. But for right now, you know what, kiddo? You need to get a job and you need to decide what you're going to do for your future. Auntie loves you. Hope to see you for dinner this Friday. Has to be the message. So we, I think we need to come up with a way to both challenge people that need to be challenged and to recognize that there's going to be some people that never ever get beyond the basics. Should they be punished somehow? Absolutely not. We still as a society make sure that they are safe, that they don't have to live on the street. And so the structural changes I think needs to be a, uh, an acceptance 
of the fact that we have always going to have different types of people in our society and we don't need to be stepping over bodies in the street. As a mentor of your brother's children, um, you're a truth teller now. You're also, and you mentioned this, a kind of a mentor for people struggling not economically, but struggling with addiction. I'd like to hear a good deal more about that. Okay. Well, um, so interestingly enough, this is the actual, this is actually the very first speaking thing I get to do on today, which is a very important day for me. Um, May 4th is what, what um, and people in my particular area call my sobriety birthday. So today I celebrate 30 years of continuous sobriety. Now, I struggled with that and it took me two years to get to a point where I went, oh, wait a minute, I'm not doing something right and I need to, to turn to the people that are doing something right and ask them to help me. Um, one of the, the ways that I have chosen to get sober uh, requires me to be able to give back to that particular group. We call it giving it away to keep it is what we, we refer to that as. Um, so what I do is I make myself available to those people that want to uh, be sober the way that I am sober. And so when somebody comes to me and they say, you know, gee, I really like what you said at that meeting or what you spoke from that podium or, or when you said this or that, I want, I want you to, be, to mentor me. I tell them exactly what I do. I say, I, this is exactly what I will expect from you and this is exactly what I do and is, this is exactly what I am expected to do by the person who mentors me. And then I give them 24 hours to think about it. Because the way I do it is not, what, it, not the way everybody else does, does it. And so I will say to them, you have 24 hours to consider whether or not I'm the person that you want in your life. Now, right now I have 17 people that I am mentoring. That's nothing. My mentor mentors 45 people. And as the result of um, the pandemic, we are able to reach people all over the world. One of the young women that I mentor is in Iran. And we have worked it out so that we work with each other through email and we do a Zoom meeting personally together once a week. And, and that's, you know, that's how we work together. I, I mentor men, I mentor women, um, but I hold them to a standard of behavior. And I tell them, if you don't want to do this, that's okay. No harm, no foul. Find yourself another mentor. And I will still love you. I will still be in your life. You can call me anytime. We will be friends. Don't ever worry. You're not hurting my feelings. Part of the standard of behavior that I hold them to is one of, of honesty. Because we can't do this thing unless we're rigorously honest with ourselves. And so that means having the guts to look at our own behavior and to see how we have affected those people around us. And to be able to take responsibility for that and also to be able to say, I want to be a part of the world in a way that is positive. As I say to people, I want people, I want other people to smile when they see me coming. I don't want them to wince. I don't want them to think, oh my God, what is she gonna do now? And that is exactly how they felt before I got sober. My family was having meetings to decide what are we gonna do about her. And I don't wanna live like that anymore. You know, I lost my mother two years ago and um, the, on this day two years ago, when I woke up, as there was every day that I stayed 
sober, or every year that I celebrated, there was a card at the coffee pot. My mother had arranged for somebody to go out and buy a card, because we were in the middle of lockdown, to buy a card that wished me a happy birthday, and it was there at the coffee pot. And I thanked her for that card when she came out that morning, and she said to me, thank you for 28 years of peace. That's what I offer to somebody that is struggling, that the people around them will look at them and say, thank you. So that's what I do. That's part of my giving back. And that allows me to sit here this morning, sober, fully dressed and in my right mind and be able to have a conversation with you guys. That's terrific. Christopher, what next? Sorry, I got lost there. <laughs> but, um, maybe you can say more about me. Um, I, I was just curious. I, I'm a lay Dominican as well. So, hey. so, uh, so you maybe you can say a bit more about what it means to be a preacher at lay, a lay Dominican. Because we are members of the order of preachers. Preachers, yes. So, so let me tell you a little bit of, of how that happened for me, which is just so interesting. So about, golly, about 20 something years ago, I listened to these, the series of talks on, it was so long ago, it was on a CD from the Catherine of Siena Institute on how to discover your charism. I don't know if you're f familiar with that at all, Christopher, but it was um, Father Michael Hurley at the time that, that did it and then another of, of the Dominican priests. And it was all about discovering who you are and what's your charism, you know, and all this. And, and it was just fascinating to me. And meanwhile, I got hired on with law enforcement and now I'm on the graveyard shift. And most of the time it's pretty, um, a pretty quiet night, you know, except for those big cases that would break. It's just a matter of let's get these warrants in there. Let's, you know, get these, um, TROs in there. Let's do the blah, 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 blah. And so, um, I would listen to podcasts and I stumbled on this podcast out of the Dominican um, um, school in Berkeley. Now I knew it was there because I went to UC Berkeley and I remember when those guys were there. And so I was listening to this podcast and one of the preachers said that what was different about Dominican spirituality from other forms of Catholic spirituality is that the Dominicans looked at the study of the faith as a form of prayer. And it was very much rooted in the tradition of the ancient rabbis who believed that studying the Talmud was a way to honor and pray. And for some reason that really spoke to me. So that started me on my journey to figure out, you know, who are these guys and how can I be a part of this? Now, I've always been um, drawn to catechetics and I was already doing work with our RCIA program and it uh, it showed when I did this charism assessment that my two strong points almost exactly together were teaching and administration interestingly enough so how do I translate that into Catholic action and what I discovered was that the spirituality of the Dominican order perfectly fits my charism and allows me to hand on the beauty of the Catholic faith to those people hungry for truth. It also allows me to learn how to train my thinking so that I don't fall into the trap of um, fear and near and knee jerk reaction. Um, and we see a lot of that in today's world. And, you know, I was a rhetoric major in college. I was um, rhetoric and dramatic art, by the way, um, is what I got my degree in from UC Berkeley. My father used to say, I have no idea what she graduated in, but I haven't won an argument with her since then. So, you know, whatever. Um, and I was able to put what my classical training went right into the catechetical training that I had had and fit beautifully into the spirituality that is offered by the Dominicans. 
And so for the last, I, I made my life profession in 2013. And during the, my time as a Dominican, what I've been able to learn to do is I've been able to learn to do as what St. Dominic did, which is to assess my audience and to meet them where they stand. To not talk at somebody, but to hand them the beauty of the truth and to hope that they want it, that they want to accept it. To not lie to people or molly coddle them or to pretend that something isn't real in order to get their attention. But to neither do I hit them over the head with something. It's the difference between doing um, brain surgery with the proper tools and with a pickaxe. And so what I've learned over the last couple of years is that being a Dominican um, fulfills me, but more importantly, gives me a spot within the structure of Holy Mother Church that allows me to exercise the charisms God gave me in such a way that gives him glory. And that's my purpose, is how can I best serve God? Mario is, is certainly thinking about what you've been saying, but uh, quid quid recipitur, modum recipientes recipitur, that which is received is always received according to the mode of the receiver. And Mario has just written a book in which mystery figures prominently. And I'm wondering if there's some element of mystery that connects with the Dominican charism, or if in fact the Dominican charism is so very, very clear that there's, as they say, a tension with the mysterious, but maybe Mario has a different line of inquiry. Um, <clears throat> this is just a, you talk about you're a late Dominican, so you, the Holy Spirit tell you, inspire you in your daily activities, and then you adjust to, to that charism. But that charism is also has some material dimension or material in the sense that you need to do something because we are incarnate, we are human beings, we are not angels. So how do you live your daily life as a Dominican? Do you follow a particular set of rules or tell us about that? Yes, um, Christopher would also be familiar with this. So there is an actual rule of the laity um, for Dominicans. Um, we are asked to pray the, the, the office in the morning and in the evening. We can do it throughout the day if we want, but we're asked specifically to do those two. We're asked to receive um, the Eucharist uh, as often as possible, to go to confession um, at least in, in our chapter, what we've interpreted that is we do it at least once a month, usually more. Um, that we are to um, look for how we can present the truth to others through our behavior, um, through our word. Uh, we study. Um, right now, um, the people in my, ch my, I'll have to show you the book we're studying here. Um, in my chapter right now, we're, we're reading through um, Thomas Aquinas' uh, a commentary, a guide and commentary on Aquinas' Thuma Theologica by Brad Davis. And we're reading through this as a um, group. And we always look at it, everything that we study, into how can, this, how can this translate into very practical application. So we do things like present um, um, retreats to the parish. We, we did a, um, a retreat during the pandemic that was on Zoom, and we opened it up to everybody in the Western province. And we had Father Sebastian White, who is the um, editor of, of Magnificat, come and do a, um, a retreat that opened up for the whole Western province of the Dominicans. 
Um, so we're required to pray. We're required to have a dedication to the rosary and to Our Lady. So we pray the, the rosary every day. Um, and more importantly, we're, tr we're, we're challenged, especially as lay Dominicans, this can be difficult, but we're challenged to find a way to do things communally, to do things as a group. So for our group, we have a standing Zoom meeting on Sunday nights where we all, anybody that's interested, signs in and we pray the final second Vespers of Sunday together on Zoom. So we look for ways in which we can be a part of a community and we look for ways in which we can worship God and we look for ways in which we can be practical handers of the truth to others. So for me, it's catechetics. For others, it might be working in um, social services. We have a group of lay Dominicans that run a, a women's center up in Seattle, and they're opening up one in Texas that is um, it's called Three Women's Group, and it's specifically for women that find themselves um, exploited sexually. They may be... Um, they may have an unwanted pregnancy. They may have, need mental health um, um, help. And it's specifically to help traumatized women. And it's right smack in the middle of Eugene, Oregon, which can be, you know, a little bit of a, a difficult thing. But that's run by late Dominicans. What, and so all of that stuff is what we try to do. What about political activism? You know, um, I think that's a really good question. Now, for me, I got chased out of both of the two main political parties in this country. Um, Your uh, American Solidarity Party, you mean? I got, yeah, I got, I became a member of the American Solidarity yeah. Party because I was chased out of the other two. I, I couldn't, I just couldn't, couldn't reconcile supporting the platforms as they were stated. And then in the Republican Party, I could not, in good conscience, support the people they were putting forward. And that actually started for me when they put Sarah Palin up as the candidate for vice president. Um, I, I, I just, I couldn't do it. I just went this, I, and so my choice was to not vote, which, was an anathema to me. I mean, the idea of not voting, how, you know, my, my God, my father was a World War II combat vet. My family fought for the, you know, to, and voting and democracy and all that stuff. How could I not vote? So I found the American Solidarity Party. And uh, that's been my home now for, for a long time. There are Dominicans that do not agree with me. What? How could that be? That are that see um, that remain um, GOP members that remain in um, the Democratic Party and become are part of the um, Democrats for Life. You know, there's no lockstep, and I think that that's important. You know, I think it's important that that people understand that. And um, while we may have chosen a different way to be politically active, and I disagree with their choices. Um, you know, that, that's their choice. And if they, if they want to present an argument to me as to why their choice is okay, I'll listen to it. You know, and then I will tell them why they're wrong. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's certainly their choice, but, but we do keep a file on them, don't we? Well, yes, we do. <laughs> I'm watching those people. You know, this has been the, I, I have to tell you, this has been one of the most difficult two years that I think I've ever been through as a Catholic. Um, people that I sort of counted on, if that makes any sense, that I probably, without realizing it, I gave them a little more um, credence and, and credibility than I should have, um, have behaved in such a way publicly that has, ha, has, for want of a better word, it just broke my heart. And uh, I will be very, very, very deeply honest, and I know this is being um, recorded. 
<laughs> but has kept me in the Catholic Church for the last two years as I watched some of this craziness is my love for the Eucharist. It's because this is where I find truth. What do you mean by craziness? When you have members, um, very visible members um, of the Catholic Church that hold themselves up as some sort of standard of behavior, standing and taking selfies of themselves, selfies on the, the steps of the U.S. Capitol during an insurrection, and then later trying to deny that they were there, that to me is scandal. When you have members of the Catholic Church going on YouTube and accusing the, the hierarchy of things that, that just are not true, and when they're later proven to not be true, not having the guts to come out and say, you know what, I reacted um, emotionally and I was wrong, and I hope you can forgive me. To, to see that kind of stuff really hurt me. I watched in my own parish, I watched divisions over whether or not to wear a mask. Who cares? I had a friend of mine, bless his heart, who put on social media this beautiful prayer that he wrote as to why he was going to, you know, he was going to follow our bishop's direction about wearing masks. And he wrote this little prayer about, you know, I'm going to offer this as a penance for the times I've used my mouth incorrectly and have hurt people with my words. And I watched so-called good Catholics just vilify him on social media to the point where he had to take his posts down. We had professions at my parish and we invited a priest from St. Dominic's in Benicia to come out and preside over those um, professions. And he said mass and he, he celebrated the mass with us. He, preached at that mass and um, he was handing out communion and he would pause about every third person and make sure that his hands were clean before doing it again and somebody actually shouted out from the pews are you going to do that after every person it's taking forever i watched that kind of stuff happen and it broke my heart it are broke you... my heart so you were surprised that we were sinners no, I wasn't surprised that we were sinners. I was surprised at how angry we were about it. I was surprised at how vehement we were. I was surprised at the level of, of attack that we did, that we went after each other. I'm a sinner. It would never occur to me to go on social media and call a Catholic that disagreed with me vile names. Now, granted, I was raised by a family that if I had used, done that sort of thing, I'd been in trouble. But I, I'm just not used to, I, I, I was shocked at that. I was shocked at the, at the way the discourse degenerated into the gutter. I was shocked at people like um, Abby Johnson being an outright flippin' racist on Twitter and YouTube and then denying that she was. And, and that just, it just really broke my heart. So I had to, to make a decision, you know, at some point, do I, do I allow this kind of thing to drive me away from the truth? Or do I ask God for the grace to love those people and to stay? And so I made my decision. I'd have nowhere else to go. My favorite apostle is St. Peter. And it's because of what he said to, to, to Jesus. He says, where else are we going to go? I just love that line in the Bible. I know I paraphrased it, but I just have this picture of this big Jewish guy going, what else are we going to do? You know, you have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? And uh, so I stay. And um, yeah, but it's been a tough two years. And I would be lying if I said it wasn't for me. It hurt me. Turn to the Eucharist, and we return to the gospel. And I think it's about time for us to draw to a close. And as always, we'll have the gospel for today. This is from John. 
Jesus said to the crowds, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Good. And thank you for, for allowing me to come on and be a part of this. I appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure. So Godspeed, and uh, we'll have this for your use in a day or two from Sebastian Muffin. He had another way Dominican. Another one. <laughs> another one. We're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I was going to give a plug for my boss's book. If anybody is interested, he, um, Dr. Doug Beaumont, um, Ignatius Press just brought out his book, The Message of, of the Movies, and it's a whole um, treatise on how um, Catholics can watch movies and um, determine the Christian messages that are often hidden in some of our wonderful movies. So if you get a chance, go to Ignatius Press and look for Dr. Doug Beaumont. I think you guys would enjoy that. So. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.